Welcome to another episode of the Automotive Architect Sales Podcast. I am your host, Ron Garvick. I want to thank you for joining me today. Uh, we got a very special guest coming on to this show. Um, I'm excited to have him on. He's He's got wealth of knowledge in the automotive industry. He also uh, he has 18 years of experience in the automotive industry. He started as a new sales consultant and moved to management roles, including BDC manager, internet director, sales manager, general sales manager. He is a founder of Dealer E-Training, where he provides training and consulting and focusing on helping dealerships improve their sales processes through internet and BDC operations. He is a student of the craft in reading about business development skills, marketing, operations, management, sales, recruiting, and recruiting. And he is a featured speaker at conference, conferences and contributes articles in the industry magazines. And, you know, He's been on several shows uh, throughout Facebook and, and social media, and I had the pleasure to have him on. And uh, I'll go to a sponsor real quick. This uh, show is sponsored by Dealer Elite, the most recognized automotive social network in the world. Sign up now and engage with the best and brightest in the industry. Also, Street Volkswagen of Amarillo. They're here to electrify Amarillo with the new Volkswagen ID4. And don't forget, the new SUV that they have out is the new Volkswagen Taos. So check them out today at www.streetvw.com. Discover your daily deal at the dating site for automobiles, streetvw.com. Here's General Manager John Luciano. You can save thousands on this showstopper, the revved up Volkswagen Atlas Crossport. Or get ultra low monthly payments on all new and used vehicles, like on the Volkswagen Atlas. And remember, many Volkswagen vehicles are famous for outstanding fuel economy. And meet the Volkswagen ID4. This affordable electric SUV is going to change everything. Hurry and discover your daily deal now at streetvw.com. Street Volkswagen of Amarillo, 5000 South Sancy. All right, we're back. Thank you for that sponsor. Um, you know, when it, when we talk about um, sales training, we talk about um, BDC finance training. People think that we do it for the money. They think we we feed them a bunch of bullshit and try to take their money and walk away. We really don't care about how the dealership or the individual salesperson um, becomes successful we just want their money and we and we walk away laughing while we have money in our pocket and that's not the case with myself and this guest we really do want to take care of the individual or the dealership to see their success that's the difference between uh us and some of the other ones out there and and it and it it develops a relationship and with that relationship you know word of mouth is the best advertisement out there if we treat that dealership or that individual well and they start seeing success in in the dealership or themselves then they start telling other people about it and with this guest that's going to be on I, I didn't realize that we have a mutual friend in duran cage that uh, that's what he's doing also. And, and, you know, you really don't know who people are till you start connecting with them and knowing that, you know, the same people and you value those same people and, and you honor those same people. And I'm, I'm proud to have, and I'm honored to have this guest on Mr. Stan Shear. Thank you for joining me today, sir. Thanks for having me. So how long have you been in the automotive business? Uh, I am going on 19 years. Uh, matter of fact, in a couple months, it's going to be 19 years. 19 whole years. That's crazy. So what, what were you doing before you got into the automotive industry? So I was in college. So I got in the industry when I was 20 years old. I actually went to school to be a school teacher. And so what happened was I started working at a young age, started working at about 14 years old. I uh, come from an Eastern European family. We came to this country when I was five years old and, uh, you know, grew up, matured really fast. I was after, I stayed home after school doing my homework, 
um, you know, before anything else. Uh, you know, I was basically being molded and developed into just maturing real quick and taking life seriously. And uh, what happened was my parents uh, decided that they're going to move out of state. They wanted to move to Florida. We were living in New Jersey. I was 20 years old. At that point, I had been working three jobs as a lifeguard and um, I was going to school, paying my own tuition. And I just bought a brand new car. And what happened was I didn't want to move. I wanted to, my life was here. I wanted to grow up here and, and do everything here. So I ended up moving out on my own. And after about three months of living on my own, I blew through my savings. And I was also at that point because I wanted to be a school teacher. I was working with kids. I was teaching uh, you know, swimming lessons and I was working as a lifeguard. And so I got into the whole teaching thing. Lo and behold, years later, here I am a trainer in the automotive industry and I speak and teach, but I wanted to work with kids. I wanted to shape people. And uh, it got to the point for me that I couldn't afford to pay my bills. And I also got to the point where I wanted to not be a pool boy anymore. I wanted a job that dresses for success. I wanted to, to wear, you know, the shirt and tie. I wanted something that would mold me uh, at that point so I can mature quicker and be taken more seriously rather than just be a lifeguard, you know, no shirt and just wearing, you know, shorts. And so I finally decided to go in the car business against my father's will. Because my father was uh, a Lexus mechanic. So he was in the business for about 10 years at that point. And he didn't want me in the business because he knew the pitfalls of the business. And he knew that if I get good at it, I may drop out of school and uh, make a career out of it. And sure enough, that's what ended up happening. And uh, by 23, I became a manager. And uh, by 27, I started my own uh, training firm, which is dealer training. Wow. And what is one thing you like about training uh, in this industry? I love being able to take somebody that doesn't have skills. Uh, I always call it the skills to pay the bills, right? Um, I like taking somebody who is young, fresh, hungry, and uh, they get into this business, they get hired, they get recruited into a dealership and uh, not realizing their true potential, just being able to train them, mold them and just seeing them, you know, go to management a year or two from that point, uh, being able to, you know, double, triple their income. And then even if they leave the industry, they go into another industry and then they text you and they say, oh, my God, you've done so much for me. Thank you so much. If it wasn't for the things that you taught me, I would never be able to make the moves that I made. And I think that's the most rewarding thing to me um, is just being able to help uh, people just develop things. Because I everything that I've learned over the years, I've learned for myself uh, to basically kind of be the jack of all trades. And I learned that from people like Ralph Padley. I don't know if you remember Ralph Padley. He's a legend in our industry who was a wealth of knowledge. He was selling cars on the internet in the 80s. You know, he's, we call him the godfather of digital marketing, but here's a man that I could sit down and talk to um, about buying cars, selling cars, running a dealership, e-commerce, SEO, um, hiring, firing, training, uh, any, you know, phone skills. I remember being on a panel with him and literally anything related to this industry, he knew. And so, I was inspired by that at a young age that I wanted to be the jack of all trades. I wanted to be able to know a little bit about everything. That's why if you ever catch me going to like a digital dealer or an NADA convention, you'll see me going to sessions. I, I like to learn things and I want to have an intelligent conversation, even if I know a little bit about the topic, just enough to understand what I'm talking about. And so for me, being able to try to give that back to other people is the most rewarding thing out there. And, and I've always said this in, in my shows and whatnot, my training, when I first came to a dealership 11 years ago, it was, that was a car lot. That's a computer that has a CRM called uh, whatever. At that time it was uh, CRM, XRM, car research, whatnot, and good luck. And I hope you make it in the car business. And when I started, you know, they were only selling eight to 12 cars a month and they had <laughs> Four salesmen. Well, they really didn't think they needed a fifth one. Long yeah. story short, I was the only one that survived uh, and stayed at that dealership for a while. I went from Green P to general manager in five years or in three years. And, and the deal was I was married up with the veteran salesman. Mm -hmm. 
His name was his, his nickname was Bull, and he was a bully, mm-hmm. and he was bullying customers to sign uh, mm-hmm. the deal sheet. And after six months, a new GM came in, and he seen that we were married up. I'd go and meet and greet, do the qualifying, get them on the test drive, come back inside, gather all their information, and then he would come in and close the deal. Mm -hmm. And the managers were like, no, 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 no. You sell your cars, and you sell your cars. We're not having this married up crap anymore. And and at that time, there was just us two. And Mm -hmm. so I was like, okay. And the first full month, I outsold the veteran and quit. He quit. He was done. He was like, wow. I, yeah, I'm not going to let this green pea beat me. <laughs> but I still, I was green. I didn't know what I was doing. I was just doing what I was told. And yeah. when it came to don't let the customer leave until he talks to a manager. Yes. It's w- what we know as TOs. So I would come and I'd walk and I, hey, boss, uh, the guy said he would buy the car if we paid for his tax title and license. Yep. Where is he at? He's at my desk. He walked over. Hey, I was just talking to Ron. He was telling me that uh, you would buy this truck if we paid for your tax title and license. Absolutely. You need to get the hell off my lot. (laughs) My eyes popped out of my head and I'm like, what are you doing? I spent two hours with this customer. So long story short, ran into the finance department. I said, I can't, I can't have him do this. I can't Mm -hmm. have him. If that's how he's going to T.O., I, I can't do this, man. What, what do you suggest? What do you think I need to do? And Andy, my finance manager, was like, you need to close your own deals. Yep. And I said, well, how do I do that? And he goes, I don't know, man, but you're going to have to figure it out. Now, mm-hmm. mind you, I never went on YouTube. I never read a book. I never – I was looking – well, the first book I ever bought was um, uh, Zig Ziglar's book. Mm-hmm. secrets of closing or something like that. Yep. But that sucker was this thick and it was not talking about the car dealership. Yeah. And so that's what I wanted. So that night I was, you know, I was down, I was depressed. I was like, man, I don't even know if I can make it in this business. And I was laying in bed and I hit YouTube and mm-hmm. I typed in how to sell cars in a car dealership. Yep. And the first video that popped up was Jim Ziegler. He was at some conference 56 minutes, 48 seconds. I was at that room at that day. I was there. I believe it was tended for managers. But, excuse me, but I was so intrigued by this man, by this man called the Alpha Dog, hat on, chains on, T-shirt with a jacket on. I was just so intrigued by his... His, his words and what he was saying. And, and I was like, that's what I need to do. Yes. And I, then I was learning that side. I was learning that side of the business going, okay, the numbers have to add up. You pencil mm-hmm. like this. Okay. And yeah. stuff that a, that a green pea salesman, I, I mean, I'm going fast in my short yeah. career. And then that video came to Steve Richards. And how to present numbers, how to present the pencil. And, and, and I would watch his videos and all these guys giving them hard clo- or objections and him overcoming them. Mm-hmm. And that was my training. I never had a training session where a manager would come in at nine o'clock and go, all right, now we're going to talk about this. If a, if a customer says, I need to think about it, what do you say? No, 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 no. You don't say it that way. You say, so let me, if your wife was here and I was like, why don't we have training? They, they, they sit there and they say, you know what? I just don't think you're going to make it. I'm going to have to let you go. You're only selling six cars a month. And, and I've watched all these guys get hired and get fired and get hired and get fired. And I'm, and I'm scratching my head going, you know, I shouldn't really worry about this because I need to worry about myself because this is my business it, yes. in all reality. It's my business. But these guys are th- this. And so I started knowing who their customers were mm-hmm. because I knew they weren't going to survive. 
I knew they weren't going to last very long. So I knew Mr. Smith. He bought a 2013 F-150 truck. He drives 15,000 miles a year. Yeah. In two years, he'll come back in because that's what he does, come back in and trade out of his vehicles. So I would learn all these customers that came in because I knew when they came back, their salesman wasn't going to be here. And then yes. they would become my salesman or my customer. So then I became a manager. Mm -hmm. And then I was like, Oh crap. These guys don't know what they're doing. They don't know what to say to their customers. And these are the individuals that's going to make me a paycheck. Yes. I need to start training. So I told him, I said, listen, this is what we're going to do. I know you guys usually showed up about nine, nine 45 every morning. We're going to start at eight o'clock now. Eight yep. o'clock, I want you in here. Do not be late. Get your kids dropped off early. Get your breakfast. Get your coffee, whatever. You, I need you in the conference room at eight o'clock every morning. We open up at nine. We are going to train. I am going to make you who I was as a salesperson mm -hmm. in a short time. Because I was the number one salesman in, in, in 500 in the auto group. So I was like, I'm going to teach you because right now you you all suck. Y'all suck at selling cars and I yep. need to mold you into where, where you need to be. And, you know, that was the training because I, and, and I, I always wonder why don't managers realize that you can't. And then it goes back to the philosophy I've, I've always said, don't tell me, show me. Correct. Don't tell me how to do something. Show me because I could tell anybody how to do something. But unless you show them, that's how they start learning. And so when I came to Street Volkswagen, that was the same same thing that they were doing there. You know, I, I was seeing salesmen come and go in the three months I was a salesman there. I went from GM to a Ford store to a salesman and a Volkswagen store. Long story. Wow. But in those three months I was there as a salesman, I was seeing salesmen come and go. And yeah. I was Hey, what kind of training you guys got? Oh, we got this training platform that we we tell them to watch. Well, do they watch yeah. them? No. Yeah. I'm like, what are you doing? So in that three months of being a salesman, I moved into uh, I was asked to become a BDC director, and I hate BDC because I had a bad experience with at the Ford store. They would set up a, or make fake appointments. You call to confirm yes. it, and the customer's like. I never said I was coming in. So I, I was in the BDC. I made it my own and mm -hmm. I was like, all right, so guys, we're going to scratch everything. What you're saying on the phones are terrible. You're not bringing customers in uh, with, with the four or 500 internet leads that we're getting. Mm -hmm. Our show ratio is terrible. Yep. I've listened to every one of y'all's phone calls. They're mm -hmm. terrible. That we're doing some training. We're, we're doing yeah. one-on-ones, but first things first, here's a mirror. I want you to hang it up in front of your face while you're on the phone. I want you to stand up because most of the time you're down like this. Hi, this is yeah. Andrew with Street Volkswagen. Uh -huh. no, I want you to stand up. I want you to look in that mirror and I want you to talk to the customer like you're talking to them in yes. front of you. And I want you to show enthusiasm. I want you to have energy and I want you to be sincere when you're talking to that customer. Yeah. And our show ratio went up, our solds went up and where we went from 26 sold internet leads, we went to over a hundred yep. internet leads sold and our production was a lot better. And, and it was, they were spot on, but I didn't let them, Use it as, uh, you know, I'm, I get paid hourly. So, hey, this is Jennifer over here at Street VW. Mm -hmm. No, I want you to be excited when you come through that door to to help serve that customer. And, and, and they're doing a phenomenal job back there now. And sometimes I walk back there going, no, 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 no. I don't want to step on your toes, Miss BDC director. But yeah. guys, you need to show some enthusiasm. You need to be excited about having this opportunity because there's so many people out there right now that don't make as much money as you make. Because, you know, some of our BDC uh, agents, uh, they make six, seven, eight grand a month. 
being on the phones. I know call centers that get paid ten dollars an hour. Yeah, that's they don't get paid much. So you have a background in BDC and internet directing, right? Correct. Yes. And what is one thing that you taught your team to do that you seen sudden change once you gave them the the direction to to be better? The one thing that I that I would say that makes sudden changes and and really it just comes down to the one-on-ones. Uh, I just finished up a project with a local independent dealer that gets 3,000 leads a month. And uh, same thing, you know, they have a BDC manager that got thrown into the position that doesn't know how to manage, hasn't tried to even learn how to manage a department in six months. And so I uh, spent a lot of time with her and it comes down to just showing her how I would run the department and, you know, going in and looking at numbers, you know, pulling reports, you know, and they were using Vint Solutions, uh, pulling in reports, you know, that Vint Solutions has a really nice report. Uh, for a B, it's like a coaching dashboard, which shows you their results and, you know, their numbers and then being able to see how many calls they make. So really, to me, it's that interaction with your people. And I learned a long time ago. Uh, so before I went into training, I worked at a dealership for a year called Teddy Nissan in, in Bronx, New York. High volume dealership. Nowadays, they sell over 400 cars. And we took that brand new store that they had just bought at the time. Uh, during cash for clunkers, when they were recovering from the 2008 crisis, we took it to 250 cars a month in the first nine months. And it was actually spotlighted in Auto Success Magazine a few months after I left. But what was interesting about that was we um, we had worked with a training company. And the what the training company was teaching us wasn't working for us. So the the my uh, GM slash managing partner, Steve Rizzo, who's still a good friend of mine till this day, um, he basically said, this is how what I want you to do. I want you to have meetings three times a week with your team. Have everybody come in 30 minutes early. You're going to be doing a coaching thing. you know." And we were using call review for accountability. So what would happen was we would look at our numbers and see, you know, look at our KPIs, where we were going wrong on the phones. You know, we were looking at what the national average is. And, uh, you know, for, for the best performing dealers and the worst performing dealers, and we tried to be the best. And we actually became Call Review's top performing BDC because we, we structured our phone scripts and what we do based on what we need. So every time – and we, we advertised crazy. Like we did a lot of mailers. Because we were in Metro New York, we did a lot of newspaper. We did a lot of digital. So we actually had uh, phone scripts. Every week we were reworking our phone scripts. And we came up with how to overcome our own objections, how to overcome how much money down on a $69 lease. You know, we came up with all that and it all came down to one thing. It came down to the delivery of the training, uh, both on a group level and individual level. If you can go in and actually hold the people's hands and actually teach them how to do the job and show them how it's done and do these one-on-ones for 30 minutes at a time, that is the biggest impact you'll ever do. You could bring me into your store and I'll stand there for three days and I'll speak for eight hours a day and teach you theory. And that's all great. But if I don't sit down with you on the computer and, you know, work your CRM and show you how I do this, you know, show you how to send out 50 text messages in a half hour and then go back to those text messages and then start calling those people because you already got them engaged. If you can't actually show people how to work a plan the right way, nothing's going to be successful. So for me, it's just it's that personal interaction to be able to give them my energy, so to speak. That's great, man. The the one thing that I that I love about the automotive industry is you can always be training and making other people better. And the one thing that, that I don't get with some of these people that the younger generation is they want to be handed Mm -hmm. everything. And I, I, I think I grew up or I got into the business right when the old dogs were phasing out, you know? Mm -hmm. So my owner was an old dog and the, 
the GMs that were training me, even though he was way younger than me, he started in the business qu uh, quicker than I did. Mm -hmm. He he was old, and the one thing with with my GM mentor is doing now is he with this new technology coming out and and like e contracting is really yeah. it is really blowing up right now. He is developing and with the times he, because he's been in the business for 42 years and but he is like okay this is the new trend we need to jump on it before anybody else does we need to get on board and learn everything that we need to learn with the e-contracting because we're going to make it even better because if a customer says man i ain't got time to come in i live in dallas and dallas is five and a half hours away no problem mm -hmm. we'll go ahead we'll send you uh the paperwork and you just need you to scan that QR code. Once you scan the QR code, I need you to put your signature in, put your initials in. We'll go over live on, on camera. We will go over live with your paperwork. And all you have to do is be sitting down on the couch and okay everything. Just hit the little button that says sign and it puts your signature there. He, you know, we we jumped on with the build a brand when it first came out. We jumped on with with um Car 360 when it came out where the where the cars would move around and you could touch the button and it would go to that feature and talk about that feature. We we were all about it. And we know that the that the times of coming to the dealership, looking at the car and then leaving and going to another dealership and whatnot, we know that time is 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 deteriorating and not non-existent people are looking online now they're yes. looking at five different dealerships within the 30 seconds going okay what's the price on this car what's the price on that car does this features have that feature okay boom hit the internet lead and then you have a short time to contact that customer get them in, interested in your vehicle give them the information that they want Hey, I want to see the car live. No problem. I'll get you with the salesperson. He'll do a live video and send it to you within yeah. minutes. Okay. Then the salesman go out there with his camera on his phone. Hey, Mr. Smith, just wanted to let you know, here's the car that you're actually looking at getting. He, he is all about that. The old dogs. And you probably see it when you walk into the stores, they're like video. Nobody does video. That is so retarded. Or, yeah. E-contracting, no, we want the customers in here. We want them to be in front of our finance department signing the paperwork. They're yeah. going to be a lost cause. They're going to lose sales because the customer wants now. Yep. They want now, an interesting, emergency. Interesting enough about video. So I like video. For years, I avoided video because I tried it and it didn't work for me. And I'll tell you why. So – what happened was I, I worked at a lot of high volume dealers, especially in the metro area. I'm in New York, New Jersey, right? So you've got dealers that get three, four thousand leads a month. It's hard to sit there and do a personalized video to every single opportunity. So, but I've been playing around a lot and I've been doing a lot of YouTube videos lately with this as well. Um, I signed up for a program called Loom, uh, which lets me share my screen and you can actually, you'll have like my face on the side and I also use quick page and I I've, I've had it for years and I, I literally started to play around with it. I ran an email campaign with quick page and loom. I did a email marketing, uh, email blast, uh, you know, for, uh, for labor day, actually, you know, even before labor day, it was mid mid August for a dealer. And it was cool to see how many opens were coming up, you know, because it was my quick page account. I kept getting my phone kept blowing up. And so I started to really utilize video a little differently, not so much, to personalize each interaction because it's hard to do when you have a big store, but I, I love video. I've been, like I said, for email blasts, it's great. I, I'm about to start marketing to dealers, sending out video messages, you know, for, for my business. And uh, so I've, I've really been toying around with the, the likes of Loom and, and uh, Quick Page. And so you can do it. There's a lot you can do with it. And it's funny because I walk into a store and I show them how I'm doing it and they see me do it and everyone's too lazy to do it. And it, it takes me a minute. And the other thing is too, and, and I always talk about this, you know, somebody asked me about like another trainer in our industry who I think is incredible. Their process is very robust. Um, and it's like, you know, what do you think? And, and, and 
my thing is, uh, you know, with every with every process, every process is tailored to the person that created that process. You know, I can't walk into a dealership and turn ten of their people into stand share. They don't have my energy. They don't have my work ethic. Um, they haven't been doing it as long as me. And so when I go and I do this video in 30 seconds and one take and I put it out there, it takes me three minutes to create an email or five minutes to create an email. For them, it's long and, and they don't really want to invest the time to learn. And that's going back to what you were saying. You know, everybody wants everything handed to them. And it's like, hey, what you did is really cool. Uh, very few people ask me how to do it. Um, I train this and I like beat a dead horse with it. And very few people are willing to adjust and adapt. So every process that we do, it, it works for us. Like I can go into any store and work my way and it'll be do very well for me. Other people, unless they have the mindset, um, they won't do it. That's why I try to spend a, a full day on mindset. I try to bring the energy to people to be like, hey, listen, get up off your butts. This is how you're going to have to work. You need to, my goal is for you to become me. If you can become me, you're going to be very successful at your job. And so, so that, that's my thing about video. And, and, and I'm the same way with the mindset. And my, my father was old school. So when it talks about the mindset, I can't sugarcoat everything. I can't go, listen, guys, this is what we're going to do. And this is how we're going to get better. Yep. It's, more, it's more grittier. It's like, listen, you're going to fall on your ass if you don't do this. Yep. You got to know your process. You, you need to get your head out of your rear end. No one's going to hold your hand and lead you to water. I agree. I could show you where the water is. I can't make you drink. I could shove an enema up your butt and <laughs> give it to you that way. But listen, I've lived your life. I've lived it. I've been at rock bottom in my life. I've thought about committing suicide. I've thought about ending my life. At the age of 25, I said, man, when I, I will not live to see the age of 25. And I'm 43 right now. And so I can't sugarcoat everything. I no. just tell them how it is. I spit it out. If you don't like what, it, what you hear, I'm sorry. But no one's grabbed me by the hand and said, this is where we're going, sweetheart. Okay. This is what yep. we're going to do. And if you fall, I'll pick you up. I'll pick you up, wipe you off and say, good job. Let's do it again. I can't. And I get, and I guess that's the military side of me is yep. you never leave a fallen soldier behind. So in this, in this case, you never leave a fallen salesman behind. You keep trying to teach them. You keep trying to coach them and you guide them in the right direction and hope to hell that they, they, they see it because it, they may not want to go down this direction. They may want to go this way because it's a smoother path, yes. but, it, and they think it's going to be easier, but it's not, you go down the hard part because you start appreciating everything that you go through. And exactly. you were talking about going, going into dealerships and getting their mindset have you, have you had any problems going into dealerships and getting buy-in from the managers? Because the GM or the owner going, hey, Stan, I need you to come in. I need you to get these guys' minds straight. I need you to coach them on BDC, coach them on, on sales. And I need you to, to get these salespeople engaged and, and bought in on your processes and then once you leave, then you got managers that are like, man, we're not, we're not going to do that because they never stepped into your class or they did step into your class, but they weren't bought in because who is this guy staying coming into our dealership thinking he knows how we run things? We're not doing it that way. Do you experience that? Oh, I experience it all the time. I, ex I experience even worse. I experience, so, uh, you know, and this happened not long ago and, and, you know, and it's one of those projects where, you come in, you give it your all, you give them all the tools and they're not going to use it. Um, I got, I got dealerships that I worked with. The managers are just ignorant completely, you know, and I'm talking about, I'm there at 9 a.m. ready to train and, you know, on a Monday and I don't see a single sales manager till 11 o'clock, just, you know, strolling. These guys are working bankers hours and they're getting paid very well. And all they know how to do is get a customer when the customer's in front of them, how to maximize a deal. But, and so I, I, I deal with that. And especially where in my neck of the woods where, where I live and, and work, but um, I have dealerships where the managers have no clue what's going on. And all they think, all they expect is here, you know, you're going to be in that room, you know, jump in on a call for, I'll give you a good example. My best friend who I, he was like my brother, he used to live with me. He runs a dealership. He had me come into his store and 
you know, he's got, it's funny because he, you know, he was trying to tell me how his BDC runs on its own. Well, the manager barely ever comes into work. Um, and then of course you had a situation where you have five really good people that have never really learned their job. They've been thrown in three months, six months, a year into it. And, uh, He's sitting there telling me like, oh, I, you know, I need you to be, you know, jumping in on calls with them. And I'm just like, well, you got me for six days. That's not how my first two days are going to be. The first day I'm assessing your problems. You're telling me that you're, it runs on its own, but yet you're bringing me in to do training. Something's wrong there. So I spend the day assessing things. The second day, I, at once I'm assessing, I'm already putting on the computer and say, okay, we need to do a script like this, a script like that. I'm going to have to set up their CRM. And so what happens is, you know, he's like, well, you're not jumping in on their calls. And I said, well, let me ask you a question. I go, how am I going to jump in on their calls when they don't know what they're doing? They're, they're just calling people. They're saying the wrong things. There's no urgency. They're booking appointments six days out. And I said, until I actually have some one-on-one -on -one time, and I, and I broke it down on the next day where I had half the group for two hours and half the group for another two hours, and I ran them through a crash course. You know, and I put that together. Then the following day, I started doing one-on-ones, 30 minutes, 30 minutes, 30 minutes, 30 minutes, 30 minutes. And then, you know, are all around the room. And then I would show them how I'm doing the work. I said, you got to let me train them first. You know, I can't just teach them by jumping in on calls. They need to know what their job is. You know, these people haven't had the love. And the thing is, everybody in the store is ignorant. The managers don't know what's going on. All they care about is, oh, we got to get the 50 appointments on Saturday. But how are we going to get there? You know, you brought me there to fix a problem, not just be a Band-Aid. And they treat it like a Band-Aid solution. And I, I got to tell you, my best my best dealers that have ever worked with me are the ones that retain me. They bring me into train. They retain me on a monthly retainer. You know, I have a lead examiner program where we can go into the CRM, look at the leads, look at how they follow up with them, do a KPI report, come back to them every month and actually do, you know, team coaching based on, on you know, what's missing, you know, what they can do better at. You know, those same dealers bring me back every two months for a day or two, and I continue to work with them. And, and that's how you grow results. Now, maybe six months to a year down the road, you probably don't need me because at this point, I got you where, where, where you need to be. But then, you, you know, things do fall off Un unless there is that accountability partner, uh, unless you're willing to make that investment. Uh, you know, things fall off. And, and again, managers tend to sometimes be ignorant. Very, very few sales managers are are bought into this. And that's the biggest reason it comes from the top because ownership doesn't get involved in forcing them. And I also think it's because there's a lack of management training. Um, you know, they think that they're superstars because they can desk a deal, but at the end of the day, there's really no management, you know, and that's why, you know, you've seen people come and go, you know, this is, in my opinion, this is why we have recruiting companies, you know, and, and don't get me wrong. I, I, I like what they do. They, they have a good business model. But this is why we have recruiting companies that are constantly going into stores for a week doing campaigns because these it, and it's always the most messed up dealerships. If you ever notice that it's the most screwed up dealerships uh, with no culture that, that have to hire these companies. Dealerships that do a good job and have a good culture do not need a recruiting company because they have a better uh, way of retaining people. They have a better company culture. Um don't get me wrong. Most dealerships just throw you into to, you know, the wolves and, and here, figure it out for yourself. But, but a lot of dealerships that do not have that culture with ignorant management, they're the ones that are constantly having to hire, bring you, bring back the same recruiter every two months, you know, bring in fresh blood, right? They say fresh blood, but, you know, put 10 people on there, get them trained up, retain three, and then let the other seven go. And sometimes even making people pay for the opportunity, which I, I think is ridiculous. But but that's the culture, because as soon as you're done with that two days of training, they don't come back with an accountability program. And actually, I do recruiting sometimes for dealers. I get dealers that say, hey, you know, I want to rebuild my BDC. You know, let's let's recruit some people. I do. I offer a, an accountability package at the end and say, great, we got them going. They made some appointments. Now let's work with them to give them more skills. Six months down the road, I want them to have other skills besides, you know, when can you come in? I, I want them to, to know how to better engage with people. Um, and the ones that buy in do great. The ones that don't buy in don't do great. It becomes a band-aid solution. Uh, but like, again, it just comes down to culture. And, you know, we're going to go to a break real quick, mm -hmm. but 
um, there's a question that I want to ask you when we get back that yeah. about that right there mm-hmm. uh, not being bought in. Uh, we'll go to a short break and we'll be right back. He has proven methods that really work. If you want to make more money, take these classes. He's intense, truthful, and he knows what he's doing. Check him out. Ron Garvick, man, where to start with this guy? Um, I've had the pleasure of working under him for the past four years. He's my manager up at Street Volkswagen, and it's just been an amazing experience. I came in as a green pea with no experience, and you know he's went over and taught me a lot of you know a lot of great stuff with the car business, whether it's negotiating, uh, trade appraisals, walkarounds, you name it. He's went over it with me, and I'm super appreciative. He brings a ton to the table, you know, a wealth of knowledge, a wealth of experience. He's worked the desk. He's, you know, he's worked every position, you know, BDC, sales. He's done everything in the dealership. So he has a wealth of knowledge and, you know, having those credentials behind him really solidifies what he's saying. You know, he knows his shit. He's good at what he does. He's had results. So definitely listen to Rod Garbrick, man. Uh, I'm very blessed to have him at the dealership and be able to learn from him directly. So tons of good stuff. Can't wait for y'all to check it out. Hello guys, my name is Joel Marquez and I highly recommend Ron Garbrick sales training because he's very passionate at what he does. Uh, me and Ron have been working together for over five years, uh, two different dealerships. I went from making two to $2,500 to pushing over $10,000 a month. Uh, yes, I'm currently over $100,000 year to date in about eight and a half months. I highly recommend you guys take advantage of all his courses. He's great at what he does. Thank you guys, have a blessed day. All right, we're back to the Automotive Architect Sales Podcast. And, uh, you know, you were talking about buy-in from the managers and them not them not really buying in. One, one question that I have is, how do you get them bought in? And the second one is keeping them bought in. How do you get them bought in? Uh, you know what? You work a couple of car deals. You jump in with them. Uh, maybe you jump in, you do a T.O., you, know, you see them work a deal and say, hey, you know what? Let me get in on this one. Let's show you guys how it's done. Uh, you build up the trust and you actually show them that you can do this. Uh, one of my favorite things outside of BDC, believe it or not, was to close deals. And I was very good at it. Um, you know, I was very psychological at it. I'm very personable. I, I, hopefully you, you could you see that. But so I used to love going out on TOs and my only downfall with me is my TOs are slow. Like I, I'm on a TO, I'll be grinding that deal for a half hour. I won't just let them go, but you know, I, I'll maximize every opportunity. You know, the desk will send me back out with a number and I'll come back with a slightly higher number. Um, you know, I, I work every deal and that's really what it comes down is go in and, and be able to show them that you know what you're doing and that you, that you can, you can do more than just go coach a call center. You can, you can go close a deal. You know, you can go box a deal. Now F and I was never my forte. I, I can box a deal. You know, I ran a used car store for a year, so I was able to do a little bit of everything. Um, you know, but this is, I'm not an F and I professional, but I know what an F and I manager does. I know what they sell and I, you know, I understand it. So, um, but that's not my forte. I don't jump into that, but I jump into closing. I, ju- I can jump into dealer track and go get a deal, but, you know, things like that. And that's really what, what you want to sometimes be able to do is to be able to build that trust. But at the end of the day, even with that, you know, some of these guys, get, it's a very ego driven business. So um, sometimes you're not even able to get people to get bought in because sometimes they just don't care. Um, and like I said, it comes from the top down. It comes from ownership. You know, um, I have dealerships where they bring me into training and the ownership doesn't even engage with me. Yeah, they cut me a check, but they don't even like sometimes care to, well, what's going on in my department? What did you fix? You know, it's it's a Band-Aid solution. But then other dealerships, it's like it becomes a thing. Hey, we're bringing in a trainer. We're spending a ton of money on this. I need you guys involved. I need you guys going in the room, learn a couple of things. You know, then, of course, there's other managers that there's always going to be that one that's going to love what I have to do and then end up taking me out to dinner one night and picking my brain and, you know, that wants to work closely with the BDC. So it's, it's a mixed bag of tricks, really. You got, um, you got a lot of different environments, but Stan, the BDC is the redheaded stepchild of the dealership. They're yeah. they're the, you know, the BDC director, they're, they're really, not a director. They're not part of management. We don't even yeah. include them 
as as part of the management because their their department really doesn't do anything for us. I'm yeah. just joking. I know. But that's what the perception is that and, and I believe, you know, I was the same way. I was like, BDC's man, the director don't know what they're doing. Just give me yeah. the leads. I can handle yeah. them. But that's the yeah. perception that some BDCs have. That's why some dealerships don't have an internet department. They mm-hmm. don't have a BDC department. They don't have BDC agents or internet got people. When leads come in, the sales manager is like, hey, Joe, come here. I got yeah. this guy. He's interested in this uh, Camaro. Yeah. Go, go call him. Yep. And there's no process. Yep. You have to believe, man. I always say the BDC is the biz, the big dollar center, and I and I say the CRM is our ATM because yeah. that's they're the heartbeat. They're the, they're when it comes to a if the dealership was a body, the heart is in the BDC. That's what keeps pumping the blood, keeps pumping the leaves out. Exactly. But there's so many dealerships that don't believe that. And that's why why now with the with the the um, the the internet and the leads and everybody going online buying cars, if those dealerships don't jump on board and get involved in the digital world, yeah. they're going to be left behind, and they're they're going to see less, especially small markets. Small a dealership in the middle of a field. Yep. I know one here in in the Panhandle of Texas, and they sell a crap load of vehicles, and they are full on force mm-hmm. with the internet and how it's all set up. And they're an auto group, and I mean, they were one of my biggest com- competitors when I was at this Ford store because they would say, "You know what? If you don't give me this deal, I'm going to go down to Vernon." And it's like, who is this? Ver- that's what happens when you hit a button. <laughs> Commercial okay. pops up. Okay. But I'm like, who is these these burning people? And they got on early on with this digital world. Yes. And and it's crazy that they would sell vehicles, internet or the invoice minus rebates. Yeah. Oh, and, yeah. and they're they're all volume because they're in this little bitty field and they have Dodge, Chrysler, Jeep, Ford. Lincoln, yep. and if you're not jumping on board on this, I tell you what, it, it's going to hurt you. So, you know, BDC, I, I love the BDC. Some people don't understand the BDC, but you you talked about TOs, manager TOs. All honesty, do you really think that managers know how to TO? Some of them, but the majority yeah. of them, they'll go there and go, hey, what is it going to take to get you to buy this car today? No, how you about know, I take another thousand dollars off? I have worked with a lot of managers. I worked with some great ones. I worked with some terrible ones. Um, I'll say that seventy percent of the ones I worked with were giveaway artists. They just come in, give away a car. What's gonna, like so? What's going to take the, the side of this car today? They don't sit there and they don't analyze things. Now, did I did I go to closing school? No, I didn't. Uh, I everything that I know, I did. It's called YouTube. It's called YouTube, exactly. But everything that I that I know and do comes from the people that I that I've been around. You know, from from the very early days, I wanted to surround myself around successful people. I got in close with my finance manager. My finance director at my first store is one of my lifelong best friends. Um, if it wasn't for being around him, I wouldn't know half the things that I know. Um, I, I was selling accurate for a year. I had a manager named DeBro, and uh, DeBro was um, he was almost about 45, 46 years old time. I was a kid. I was. 23 and I was selling Acuras. And so one thing that I learned from DeBro, and he's a good friend of mine too, is that, uh, so he, he was selling cars for about four years, but before that he worked in collections. So over the phone. So what's interesting about him coming from collections is he's got that background where he thinks, you know, he listens to the customer and he thinks about a response. And even when, regardless if he closes the deal or doesn't close the deal, he'll always talk to you about, You know, hey, you notice how when the customer said this, you notice how, you know, that, you know, this happened. And so working with him, I worked with him for a year and he was a salesperson that worked with me. But because my GSM at the store was lazy and useless, um, all he did was desk deals and and look up stuff on the Internet on eBay. 
um, they would use the bro to jump in and, and, and help close deals. So I would learn from him. And what's funny is that was, that's the one guy that years later, even now, I still operate like him in a way where, you know, you, you give me a green pea in a dealership and I'll go on TO and I'll be like, Hey, listen, don't say a word. Let me do the talking. Um, pay attention to what I say. And then when we leave the customer, when we go to the desk, I'll usually say, you notice how this happened and how I said this and do you notice how they said that? And so that to me is a real TO, in my opinion. It's to be able to analyze the situation. Now, am I the best at reading people? I'm probably not. There's people that are better at it. But for some reason, if, if, I, if I was to sell other things in cars, I might not be as good at it. But for some odd reason, when you put me in front of a customer that's buying a car, maybe it's because I this is my craft. I know what I'm doing. I just I'm great at it. And um, again, it's all from analyzing the situation. And a lot of guys, they don't do that. They jump in, try to make the numbers work. Nowadays, it's actually easy because everybody's making money by accident, right? There's no inventory. So right. let's let's sell at a premium and, and bury people, you know, because that's what's going to happen in about a year. Everyone's going to be buried. And uh, 2008 is going to come back around, but it's going to be in the car market, in my opinion. But it is what it is. You know, right now we're chasing profits um, and anybody can be a superstar. Uh you know, the people that, that, in my opinion, weren't great are actually doing great now. Um, and, you know, the truth's going to come out eventually. But to me, I don't think most managers are good closers. Um, I think the ones that have a good F&I background um, are good closers because they, they know. But you put somebody that didn't actually have management training or somebody that didn't immerse themselves in studying their craft and all they know is how to punch numbers in the DMS, you know, they're not good closers. And one of the things that, that I like is I didn't, I, I, I'm the kind of person that I don't believe in, in TOs, manager TOs for the reason I've been burned so many times when I was a salesman getting a yeah. TO. Hell, when I was working at this store for three months as a salesman, I never went out and got a TO. I, I sat there and grind the customer and yeah. find out what the problem was, was the price product payment or, or me mm -hmm. person. And then I, I overcame the objection. So what I teach my guys is you got to learn how to close your own deals. You got to know, listen to what they're saying yep. and find a solution to solve their yep. problem. And so it's funny when we're in these sales meetings and you hear the manager, the, the sales managers, I want a TO on every customer and I'm, inside going, Oh, please don't take a TO learn how to close your own deals. That's why I have training every Monday morning for two hours of the people that want to learn how to close their own deals. So they don't have to. And, and the, the, the best part about it is they're the ones that are making the most grosses and selling the most cars because yep. they're not getting up and leaving that customer alone so they can turn to each other and go, okay, when he comes back, we're going to say this next because yeah. he's going to come back and he's going to say, okay, um, we'll give you free tint. And then we tell them, well, you know what? We want that powder coated wheels too. And yep. then he's going to get up again. We're going to get the most we can get out of them. Okay, George, listen, yeah. we're going, we're going to make sure that they're losing money on this deal. And it's like, okay, guys, every time you get up, you devalue the proposal. Use credibility. So stay seated. Yes. And grind that customer. And you still got those ones coming up. Uh, hey, hey, Kyle, uh, uh, customers said they'll go ahead and buy this deal if uh, we go and throw in tents. Mm -hmm. Okay, tell them whatever. We'll throw in 10. We'll take yeah. another thousand dollars off the price, too. Yeah. Hey, my manager said he'll go ahead and do the tent and take a thousand dollars off on the deal. All they wanted was the tent. Why'd you take another thousand dollars off? Because they don't listen. They, they no. don't listen. They just, just whatever to do to, you know, we've had this vehicle for 45 days, whatever it needs to do to get this deal done. And I'm, and I'm like, no, come here. You tell them this Yep. and, and shut up. And they'll, they'll go and tell the customer this, they'll shut up and come back and goes, all right, they're going to take, take the tent and the thousand dollars off. They're like, no, they're not taking the money off. What do you mean? I, I didn't tell them we were going to give them any more money yeah. off. I said, Hey, well, we'll go ahead and do the tent and, but we're going to add it to the price. And they were okay with it. Why did you tell them they're going to add it to the price? Cause that's what Ron told me to tell them. Why, why give it away? 
So, I mean, that that's just me. That's just the way I work. And that's the, my belief is maximize every dollar, close every deal. I mean, solve the problem. If, if you did a, a hell of, of a presentation on the car where they're licking the paint off of it, you shouldn't have to do anything else. You, you shouldn't have to negotiate price all the time. And my good friend, Tim Kent's always says, hold gross, hold gross, hold gross, sell the car. And so if you're holding the gross and you did a proper presentation on the vehicle and a, and a great walk around and, and, and if they're trading and you did a great job on the, on the trade appraisal, the customers bought in on the car because they love it. Yep. Then you don't have to give anything away. You can get them into finance and, and plug in seeds into their head about protecting yeah. their asset that they're spending thousands and thousands of dollars on. Hey, you may want to get an extended service contract on this. We're offering three year 36, but after your 36,000 miles, that's typically when the vehicle breaks down and you did say you drive 15,000 miles a year. So in two and a half years, you're going to be out with a warranty and you plan on keeping this vehicle for, for four or five years, I highly suggest you protect your vehicle and get an extended service contract because the last thing I want to do is see you in the service department and you're mad at me because your vehicle broke down. I want to see you in the service department. You telling me, hey, man, I'm glad that you told me about this extended service contract because I don't have to put a deductible down and my transmission just went out. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's great to learn what to say and how to say it. And my, my philosophy, you may get a manager title, but you're not a manager unless you become a great leader and a great coach. And that's through every, every department. You have to be backing the finance department, the BDC department, the parts and service department. You never want to say a bad word about the service department. You never want to say a bad word about the internet department because you, you guys are all one running machine when it yep. comes to a dealer. And that's how you're going to be um, uh, proper or prosperous in the automotive industry. So, I mean, it, it's, it's crucial to keep that idea every time you want to, uh, to develop a relationship with each department and customers. So we'll be back in a moment. All righty. Not, okay. not only do we have the Automotive Architect Sales Podcast, but we do have the Manager TO Podcast. Um, what it's basically about, it's just a bunch of closes on customers or helping salesmen with customers that say, I need to talk to my wife. I need to talk to my husband. I need to think about it. That price is too high. Uh, the payment's too high. It's just a big purchase. I need to pray about it. It, it, and it's, I mean, I did it daily. So I got over a hundred closes that you can give to your customers. It's the, uh, manager TO podcast. You can find it on any platform that you listen to your podcast. So I'm going to do something a little bit different today, Stan. It yeah. is when you five questions, five questions, Good. you can plead the fifth on some of these if you like, um, but it, it's just rap fire questions. First one, past, present, or future, who do you think right now, in your opinion, is uh, the, was, is, or going to be the top of their game in the training platform? <laughs> I would love to say me because uh, of the things that I'm working on. But I got to say, I, I got a lot of respect for my colleagues. You know, I, I met Jonathan Dawson uh, two weeks ago at an IADA. I think Jonathan Dawson uh, is an absolutely incredible sales trainer. I got a lot of respect for him. Um, I like what he's doing with uh, with his Pinnacle Society, I believe it is. Um, then I see other people. I see Alex Flores out there who owns dealerships and he's consulting dealerships. So I think there's a lot of really, really great people out there. Glenn Lundy's another one. Um, I'm just honored to be amongst that group of people that I think are, are going to be, you know, 
at the very top of their game. And I, I think being doing this for 11 years now, um, I'm reinventing a lot of what I'm doing. And so I'm, I'm hoping that I'm going to be at the top of my game with what I do. But I certainly welcome um, the healthy competition. And, you know, uh, Sarah Hoagie's another one. She does training and she has an outsourced BDC. You know, I got a lot of respect for a lot of my colleagues. I feel like I would not be me. I would not be where I'm at if it wasn't for them because some of them came before me. You know, uh, Joe Webb was another one. You know, Corey Mosley, Jennifer Suzuki, Elise Kephart. I got a lot of respect for all these people and every right. single one of them. Tim Kintz. You know, these guys all have something to offer. I mean, these people have all something really good to offer. So I, every one of us should be at the top of our game. There's enough to go around, and we all have something unique that we offer. And the good thing about every one of those people that you mentioned, they are always willing to help also. Yes. They don't look at they don't look at you and go, Stan, I'm the best. Mm -hmm. I'm the best of who I am. I'm better than you. So when when a, when a dealer looks at you or they look at me, they're gonna pick me because they know yeah. I'm the best. No, no, no. That's not them. That's not Jonathan. That's mm -hmm. not that's not Elise. That's not Jim Ziegler. There, I've talked to Jim on the phone. He's giving me advice. I've talked to Jonathan. I've talked to. Corey, I went to yes. Corey's workshop in Tampa. I've talked to Shaka Dyson, Tim Kintz. I'm going to his train the trainer workshop uh, in a couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. he, he's invited me to go there. And I've talked to him on the phone. I've had him on the yep. show here. I mean, all these people yep. that you mentioned are always willing to help each other. Oh, let me also add. Let me also add Duran Cage, uh, who's a very old friend of mine. Uh, who I think is doing incredible things as well. I think he's at the top of his game. Uh, sorry about that. I, I failed to mention your name, buddy. Yeah, yeah. I was, I was, I was trying to reel you in on that one. I was like, oh, you didn't say. Dur no, I'm playing. Yeah. Duran, <laughs> I, I honored Dur Duran, mm -hmm. and we're two different people. He's more in a, in a s sophisticated way yeah. of his training, and I'm more grit. More, you know, it, it, if the training. Uh, atmosphere. Our training platform was uh, WWE wrestling. I would be the Stone Cold Steve Austin of of the training because I, I don't sugarcoat anything. And yep. and sometimes when I talk to Duran, I, he he feeds me this that, and he's all calm and collect, and he's man, listen, Ron, and I really deep down, I love having conversations with him because he keeps it real with me. And just like I keep it real with him, but he, he, I like talking to him when, when I have doubts sometimes I'm like, man, I don't even know if I want to do this anymore. I don't think I'm getting to the, to the, to my audience the way I want to. And he's like, listen, man, I listen to you. There's a lot of things that you do that, that I'm like, wow, man, that that's incredible the stuff that you're doing. He goes, and then I implement it in my training. And I think what, what would Ron do if, if uh, he was in this situation? And I'm like, really? And he goes, you, you don't know how much that I respect you in what you do and what you're doing, Ron. And, yep. and it's great to have that conversation with other people and connecting. And, and he has that with Corey Mosley, Corey Mosley is his mentor. And, but it, you know, I'll have where I'm having issues and I'm trying to help the BDC department. I called mm -hmm. Duran. If yep. I'm ha having issues, because I am the finance director at the store, if I'm having issues with uh, overcoming objections or teaching my guys in the finance department, I call Shaka Dyson. Mm -hmm. When it comes to closing, I can't call Grant Cardone, but I sure in the hell can call Tim Kintz and go, man, I'm having issues trying to get these salesmen bought in on learning how to close. And I have him helping me. So we're all connecting. And I agree with you on on these trainers and and each and every one of them is the best in their uh profession you know rise and grind glenn lundy uh uh encouraging and and, and putting um enthusiasm into his people that watch his show alex flores man the man bounce off the walls and he mm -hmm. showed how he he came from a um 
a restaurant business as a waiter to right. working at a dealership to now owning dealerships and and the the uh, enthusiasm and effort that he puts into his people to make them better and Elise with BDC and doing the stuff that she's doing with phone calls and Corey Mosley with owning your own business and being that entrepreneur in the uh, training space. He's got a, a wealth of knowledge and, you know, but I'll go with the old dog, Jim Ziegler. He helped me out a lot. I love uh, Jim. Jim and I are, are very old friends. Um, Jim has helped me out a lot. Jim has given me some opportunities. Um, we, we've come through a lot together uh, over the years and he certainly mentored me and uh, I, I got a lot of love and respect for the alpha dog. Uh, alpha dog all day long. Steve Richards, he helped me out a lot when, when I first got in with the uh, penciling and overcoming objections when you're presenting a pencil. Shaka Dyson mm -hmm. has helped me in the BDC realm. Um, Corey Mosley's helped me in building the automotive architect empire in Garve Automotive. Tim yep. Kent has helped me with with you know, bringing people in and understanding being a manager and becoming a great closer. And, you know, it, it's just so many people out there that are willing to help people out. And I know that was the first question. Second okay. question. Are you, are you a tea drinker? Uh, I am. I drink green tea actually. Um, okay. I like, you know, and I, I, I like my green tea, strawberry infused. Um, so I, and I, my favorite tea is the one that Starbucks sells. And I don't like Starbucks coffee, but I love the tea. Um, I'm big on drinking green tea. Matter of fact, I have, if you see this right here, I have a whole gallon. This is a, a, a ocean spray white cran strawberry bottle, but this is all green tea here infused with strawberry. Oh, wow. wow. So, yeah, I am a tea drinker. So I was going to ask, are you a sweet or unsweet tea drinker? Unsweet. Um, it's funny. I, I, I love sweets, but as far as coffee and tea is concerned, I do not like sugar in, in my drinks. I don't. I don't. Uh, I'm huge unsweet tea drinker. Yep. That's all I drink. I, mean, I drink a, a little uh, energy drink, not not like Monster or Red Bull yeah. or anything like that. Uh, on my way to work. After I'm done drinking that, while I'm still driving, because I have an hour driving, so 15 minutes the energy drink, another 15 minutes a bottle of water, another 15 minutes I drink my coffee, and I drink coffee till noon, and yep. then I'm an unsweet tea drinker till I go to bed at night, and I make sure that I fill the Automotive Architect cup up with my Smart. tea, and I drink it at night when I'm Love it. waking up, and then wake up in the morning, I take a swig of tea and then I make me a cup of coffee. So All right. Third question. Do. Huh? Pretty much what I do. Same thing. Third question. Outside of the automotive industry, what podcast do you listen to? Um, so I listen to um, Bradley. I love Bradley's and I know that he started his, his business in automotive I uh, listen to Brad and Lee. I, I love listening to the Wolf's Den. Uh, big Wolf of Wall Street fan. Um, love the movie. But I actually saw Jordan Belford speak before, so I was really blown away. I think he's got really great content. Um, he's got a really interesting selling system. And so I certainly try to learn as much as I can. Very expensive. So whatever free things I can watch, I, I'll watch. So, um, But I would say probably Brad and Lee and uh, – the Wolf's Den. Those are probably the ones that I, I listen to the most. I got them. I got them on my uh, on my podcast also. Um, few few that I that I uh, listen to is Legends of the Old West, Infamous America. Uh, I'm into. I got Bradley on here. I, I used to be a huge wrestling fan. WWE, WCW kind of wrestling so i like to hear backstories on how people got into the business so something to wrestle with uh the steve austin show and one that i just finished and and, and was really good was mafia i'm a huge mafia fan me too and you know um my gm owner is uh, a luciano he's okay. a he his family came from uh new york okay and then, they found their way to El Paso, 
Texas. Okay. And so, I mean, he still got roots in, in, in the city. And yep. so, but he doesn't have that accent. He has, he don't oh. even have a Texan accent, <laughs> but it, I mean, his mom and his dad, they had the New York accent and he does. I mean, but he, he just hearing stories about, about the old days and how people, his dad's name was Charles. And so people, you know, thought, Hey, you know, they didn't send lucky to Sicily. They sent him to, uh, he found his way back through Mexico and ended up in El Paso, but it's not true. He That's cool. <laughs> but that's, he's a Luciano. And it's funny cool. when, when you get people come in that, that have the Italian accent. They're like, I need to talk to Mr. Luciano. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you mean uh, John Luciano? <laughs> <laughs> There's actually one other podcast I listen to. I listen to the Metal Summit. So if you could see behind me here, I have two guitars. That's two out of 12. I'm a, I'm a big guitar player. You might find me on social media sometimes playing around. I did. I did see you playing on your, on your yeah. Facebook. So, that leads to my next one. Yeah. Your favorite band. Oh my God. Um, that's such a tough one. Um, there's so many bands that I like it. It's in different genres, but mm -hmm. I gotta say my, my, my number one favorite band is dream theater. Um, I don't know if you've ever heard of dream theater. No. Um, so Dream Theater, they've been around for about 30 plus years now. They are a progressive rock band. So I come from a musical family. My father was a drummer. My mom was a classical music teacher. She played piano. And um, so from a very young age, from the time I was born, we were a musical family. So, I mean, I was spinning records in the old country and I was three years old. I would get up out of bed and I would go and I would put on a Led Zeppelin record and put on my headphones and I would rock out at three. And so um, I got into progressive rock, you know, like my dad got me into, you know, Chicago and what's what in tears and uh, Grand Funk Railroad, which I was dancing to the other night to burn some steps. And um, but Dream Theater is one of my favorites because Dream Theater is they're they're a heavy metal band, but they're a progressive band. So they're it's almost like Yes and Metallica combined. So, you know, they're, they're experimental You know, they have 20 minute songs. Um, they're my favorites. The guitar player, I will never be able to be 5% of how good he is, but uh, he's amazing. And uh, But that's my favorite band. And I also like Winger because I also love the guitar player. People might make fun of me for liking Winger, but Winger is an amazing band. And, uh, you know, like Red Beach, I love his tapping style. Um, I like White Snake. I'm actually friends with one of the guitar players in White Snake. Um, there we go. Dream Theater. Yep. That's. Uh, that's from a live concert from a couple of years ago. This guy is amazing. Um, highly recommend them. They're going to be on tour soon, and I think they're releasing their album next month. Um, but you're talking keyboard, synthesizers, guitars. Um, every musician is just incredible. Winger, 80s band, right? But just I'm a big fan. It's uh, The musicianship is incredible. For me, it's all about the musicianship of these bands. Um, I take that very seriously. One of the, the bands that I, I mean, I, and I'm a genre kind of guy too. I mean, mm -hmm. I grew up in Southwest Kansas. So I was George Strait, and I was Johnny cash. And then, then on the other side, uh, I remember the eight track tapes that my brothers would listen to in their vehicles and they had poison. Yep. Or, or, you know, the country, they had Alabama, Johnny, Johnny yeah. Cash, Johnny Paycheck. And then on the cassette side, when it first started coming out, the, the little cassettes, if people mm -hmm. don't know what that is. And it was, it was Heart. And it was heart. Uh, Metallica. Mm -hmm. And it was Poison and, and ACDC. Yep. And then one time I was fiddling through their, their tape deck in their truck with a spit tune right by it. And I pulled this little cassette tape out and it said, Eddie Murphy raw. Wow. That was awesome. I love that. <laughs> and I remember Eddie Murphy from uh, 48 hours, yep. another 48 hours and Beverly Hills cops. Hall. I gently took the cassette out, put the case back into the slot. And at night I would listen to Eddie Murphy raw. It's such a fun. I love that. That's one of the best comedy uh, skits ever. And it got me intrigued into doing stand-up comedy. Yep. I was a shy kid till I listened to that that whole tape. Yeah. 
And I was like, I want to be a comedian. I want to be funny. I want people to laugh at me. I want to tell jokes. I want to do voices. And so I, I got into uh, listening to a lot of Eddie Murphy. But band-wise, man, I still I listen to Metallica. It depends on how I feel uh, when I'm driving home. Metallica, ACDC, um, you know, your, your poison. And then I listen to country and then I listen to rap and I have this whole, and you know, I, I, I came from in high school and a couple of time, uh, years in college that I was a radio disc jockey. So yep. I, I have a, this whole genre that I would listen to. Um, then you had Fleetwood Mac, the Bee Gees. Yep. Uh, then you know. You, then you're listening to. Okay, now there's Michael Jackson, and what what did Michael Jackson do before he was Michael Jackson? Oh, there was the Jackson Five, and then you learn. Oh man, look at this! Now you have the Temptations, and then you have the Supremes, and who is this guy over here? Oh, that's Marvin Gaye. Yep. And then this, then it goes into. Oh, this is. This is Buddy Holly. Man, I like Buddy Holly. And it, so you, it, it, you start going and, and pinpointing where all these people came from. And, you know, Wham, they had George Michael was with Wham. Yeah. And people are like, oh, no, you're listening. Now you're really going in deep. No, I love that music. 80s and, and 90s music was my genre. But now I'm, I'm going back to the 70s. And I was always a 60s doo hop band. I yeah. wasn't so much on the Beatles, but now I listen to the Beatles. And it's just, it, you're like, wow, this is crazy. Well, you know what's funny about the, and, and I, I'm just like that. I like, you know, the Beatles were big in my household. What, you know what, what I, and this is something that I learned from the Beatles and moving on to other artists is that when you hear other musicians cover, cover the music uh -huh. you, more, you start to really think deeper about how they created the music originally mm -hmm. and i figured that out a lot with the beatles there's so many great interpretations of their songs by instrumentalists and then you really realize that the beatles music is just unmatched like they're the one band that like you can make so much cool music out of you know that inspiration and i i i saw that a lot too like with ozzy osbourne when he had uh randy rhodes in the first two albums that he did you know, they have this um, annual show called uh, Randy Rhodes Remembered, where you get to, you get a bunch of amazing, you know, heavy metal, hard rock guitar players, and th they get together with a band, and they're playing, you know, everything that Randy Rhodes did with Ozzy, and you get to see how they play it in their own way, and that's basically how these guys learned how to shred, and how they learned how to play guitar. So you really appreciate when you hear other musicians cover this stuff. And the, and the thing about you know. Uh when you listen and I'm saying, listen, not hearing it, but listen, yeah. you listen to the words. Yeah. You may not like rap music, but you listen to a two box song and you can understand yes. what he was going through in his life. You listen to a, a Jay Z song. You understand what's going on in his life. All you're hearing is beats and rhythm and you're hearing uh, rhymes but if you listen, yeah. you'll hear a lot of stuff. Same thing with, with uh, heavy metal music. And I'm yeah. not talking about the... Yeah, that's crazy, yeah. I'm talking about um, when you listen to a Metallica song and you listen to their words. Yep. That they're, the message that they're trying to give. Take that message, you put it in a country song, now you hear it. Yep. But if you if you're just hearing the bass and the drums and the and the yeller, you're not going to understand it. But if you listen to the words, and that's yeah. why, well, I'll, <coughs> excuse me, I'll listen to a song and I'll read the lyrics. Yeah, and I'm like, wow, that is deep. That is really deep. And people don't listen; they hear it, but they don't listen, and that's the problem. That's a problem with the society today on everything. They don't listen. Yep. Last but not least, what do you plan for the future? What is your future plans? My future plans is growth. I am in growth mode. I've had, um, so I didn't even talk about this. I wrote a book that mm -hmm. hopefully will be out in a month. It's being going through editing right now. Um, I have my own. How editing. easy is to write a book? Uh, you know what? It's not. Um, I talked about it for three years. Uh, my friend Tracy Myers, who's a car dealer and a friend, 
you know, like years ago I wrote, you know, that everybody needs to write a book at some point. It's a journey, right? So I, I started writing a book about sales and marketing. I left, left that on the back burner three years ago, four years ago, maybe. And um, last year when I finally, you know, it was during COVID, I started flying out to dealerships again. I started to write a book. Um, I wrote the first two chapters uh, on my trip, you know, going there, going back. I was on a flight for three hours. And then I said, okay, you know what? If I can do two chapters, I'm going to finish this book. And then I just left it alone and didn't do anything with it. And then all of a sudden, um, it was there. I think I, I wrote like another chapter, like in December when I was flying again. Then all of a sudden, I came back from Digital Dealer in Tampa um, in June. And I was, for some reason, and then I got COVID like two days later. And then... All of a sudden, as I was starting to recover from COVID, the first day that I got my energy back and I'm like, all right, I got to do something. I'm laying in bed and in three hours, no joke, I wrote chapter, I finished up chapter three and I went through chapter eight and I did it in three hours, literally on my phone, laying down like this, typing in the notes, you know, not even on the computer. And I, and I typed it all up and I said, okay, we're going to get this done. One or two more chapters left, right? And then of course, boom. All talk, no action. I got on the phone with George Nenny from uh, Gener was Generations Digital. I have a sticker here. He's a, he's a friend of mine. He's big on you know, Google and SEO. And he, he gave me some tips on how to get published. And that was uh, two months ago. And then I was like, all right, I'm going to finish this book this week. And then, I, again, I never got it done. Finally, um, a week and a half ago, I sat down and I wrote my last two. Actually, no, believe it or not, what happened was I went to NIADA in San Antonio, on my way back, uh, I decided I have nothing to do. My, my, you know, my, uh, my headphones died. I can't listen to music. I'm like, I'm going to write it. I'm going to finish writing this book. So I jumped on and I, I wrote the last two chapters. I finished writing that book literally as we landed in Newark airport. And I'm like, wow. I even made a post on LinkedIn and social media. I'm like, that's it. I, I'm done with my book. And then, um, so, and then I went and I edited some things and I gave it to my fiance. She's, very college educated, very smart, can construct sentences. Uh, because what happens is a lot of people, you know, you get criticized by people that want to proofread your book. You, you, you have a book that's a bestseller. And I know Grant Cardone talked about this. You can have a bestselling book that's not best written. And, you know, an English major is going to sit there and they're going to criticize how you construct the sentences. It's, it, you know, you got this wrong and this wrong. And you know, he's like, dude, I sold a million copies. I'm a bestseller. Like, who cares? Yeah. You know, all this, all this stuff that you learn in school doesn't really apply to real life when you come to think about it. But at the same time, you know, I didn't want to, because the way I write, I write from the heart and I write what I think and as if I'm speaking. So she's literally out there and she's editing it for me. I bought her a, I bought her a keyboard for her iPad so she can edit it for me. Once it's edited, I already, I already have a photographer that, that already, I already booked sessions for I got to get a haircut, obviously. You know, do it every two weeks, and um, we're getting a little nappy right there. Yeah, no, I, I actually, I have a really good barber. She, I, every two weeks, she does like uh, fades. I mean, I, I'm, you know, she does a really good job. So I'm gonna right. get that done for the pick. I'm gonna get suited up. Um, so uh, we, uh, I'm hoping to maybe get this out in a month or so. Um, I was gonna do it for Digital Dealer, but I'm not sure if it's gonna happen because we're cutting it close. Um, but uh, the book is basically almost about everything that we talked about. It's from, from uh, I haven't even come up with a title yet, but it's basically from me starting out in the workforce and from falling apart. A couple of years ago, three and a half years ago, I went broke. I almost lost, I, I bought my condo and eight months later, I almost lost it. I got a little crazy. I was, you know, I got out of training for a little bit. I started a social media business and I got stabbed in the back. Uh, by a major client whose name I'm not going to mention, but we all know his name. Um, he's out there and uh, got stabbed in the back. And uh, basically, you know, it broke. I had a business partner, it broke up our business and I went broke to the point where I um, almost had my car repoed. I almost lost my house. I was eight months behind. And so what happened was I went back to, and this is why I always talk about the skills to pay the bills because I went back the basics. I, um, I took a job driving Uber because the training business was, was quiet. I didn't do much with it. I did little things here and there, but the social media business just tanked. I was on my way to building a million dollar business and it just tanked. 
And so I took a job. I humbled myself. I took a job driving Uber for about two months. It actually was Lyft, not Uber. And I drove Lyft for two months just so that I can make some money to pay for groceries, pay my light bill, and pay for gas to go on job interviews. And my hustle was I would go and I would apply to 80 different jobs. Like three hours a day, I'm on Indeed, I'm applying for jobs. And I'm interviewing and interviewing. And this way, I have a choice of where I'm going to work. So all of a sudden, um, a friend of mine um, opened up a dealership. He bought a new dealership. And he offered me a job to be a BDC director. So I took it. But turned out he wasn't a good friend because he stabbed my back six weeks later. He fired me after I started to put his marketing together. He just fired me randomly on a Saturday, which I didn't expect. And I had gotten recruited to go um, manage a BDC in an Acura store. Um, I took a took a bit of a pay cut from what I was doing, uh, but you know it was a consistent job, a great culture. So I took I ended up, you know, t negotiating a bigger pay plan. I took this job and I did it. I was a working BDC manager for a year, where I actually made calls and I also uh, you know helped manage a department. Uh, really great store. And I did that for a year. While I was doing that, I was driving Lyft and I picked up a couple of social media clients. I also had two clients that brought me back for training. So I was at the point where I was working six days a week, nonstop, bell to bell, um, especially with the hours I put at the store because one of my coworkers got sick. So I was, I was doing a lot and uh, I paid off $30,000 in debt in eight months. And you know, got everything back in order with my house. Everything was cool. Fixed my credit. Um, and, uh, you know, and then lo and behold, you know, I ended up leaving the job because my father was about to pass away. He passed away right before uh, the country shut down. And so, but I got myself out of that hole by working really hard and working on every opportunity. When I wasn't at the dealership, I was at home working on my business. Um, and I, I essentially stopped driving Lyft after a couple of months because I, I, I brought, I started to realize my self-worth again. And so I got on the hustle. So then I left that job. My father passed away. I took two months off. And then a friend of mine called me up. He has an outsourced BDC company, dealer retention services. I need you to run my company. I said, sure. So I went and I spent about nine months uh, running uh, his company, helping him out. I was the chief operating officer. I did everything from training to, uh, the, the helping our team, you know, we had a 20 person team in Tom's River, New Jersey, and I was running that business. And while running that business, I got back into, again, the skills to pay the bills. I got back into the marketing, the social media, writing for magazines again. All my energy came back and all of a sudden I get a call from uh, Steve New from Pay Here Marketing, who I worked with years ago at Call Review. And Steve New started a buy here, pay here marketing company, which is, the other thing of what I do is I've been doing a lot of buy here, pay here. He said, hey, listen, I got 40 dealers. They need training um, for buy here, pay here. I said, great. I flew out to one of his dealers. I actually learned how to do buy here, pay here. I spent the week in a store, learned the process of buy here, pay here, created a whole BDC and sales training process for buy here, pay here. And about 50% of what I do now is buy here, pay here. Wow. If I'm not in an independent or a new car store, I'm doing buy here, pay here. Either it's performance management for pay here marketing. Uh, or it's uh, getting their dealership to handle leads better because we handle, we generate a, a, a specific kind of lead. So I got into that and I ended up leaving dealer retention services because I, I got more focused on the training again. So that's what I've been doing for the past, I don't know, eight, nine months now. Um, since December, I've been focused on that. I also started a credit repair business, which was about nine months ago, which somebody gave me the idea to do it. So I studied on YouTube an hour a day for six months straight, watching videos, reading about credit repair. And it's a little side hustle. You know, there's weeks where I make $1,000 doing it because I sign up three customers and I, and I get the work done. Um, and that's without marketing. We're going to build a website soon and do all that. But basically, that, that's what the book is about. The book is about, you know, starting from nowhere, growing, humbling yourself, falling, and then coming back and, and I'm giving people the blueprint on how to do that and the book, because I want people to be empowered. I'm, I'm sick and tired of people. Like we talked about earlier, expecting things. Um, you know, I got a mortgage to pay. I got a car to pay. I got three pets to support. You know, after my dad passed away, I was supporting my mom for a year. Uh, so I was paying two mortgages and I had to work and hustle and do whatever I can to, to make a living and, and, and live a decent life. And the whole point of the book is 
to be able to, to empower people to just get up there and do it and learn every skill that you can. You know, learn how to market, learn how to sell, learn how to communicate, learn how to put yourself on social media, get yourself every opportunity, everything that comes your way. Even being on this podcast, I mean, that's an opportunity. People are going to watch it. Someone's going to like what I have to say, and it can evolve into something else. Exactly. And even if nobody watches, it doesn't matter. I'm going to promote it, and somebody's going to eventually watch it. And I, I, that's and that's where those podcasts come into play. That's where your your Grant Cardone's and your Gary V's, which is another podcast I listen to. You know, Brad and Lisa, this all that. You know, that's really more so to empower you to to do these things. And so I, I decided to put a book out there. I hope it sells big. I'm looking forward to selling it and. Uh, I want to give it out to salespeople so that they learn that they need to hustle. We need to bring back those old traditional values uh -huh. uh, you know, of how things used to be. Well, let me know when the book comes out. I'll be happy to uh, uh, promote it and, and let people yeah. know how to, how to contact you and how to get it. So uh, I appreciate you being on the show, my friend. Mm -hmm. it, it's an honor to have you on, uh, you know, watched you on several other podcasts and, uh, our boys over here at yes. Target Coffee. Speaking of them, there's the mug. Uh oh, I got the same <laughs> mug, my friend. Yep. You always got to yep. keep in mind, keep growing, yep. keep growing, keep growing. And don't forget to tag on to their podcast, the Car Guy yes. Coffee Podcast. They're always on. I always like to promote them, let people know about them. Uh, like they don't know, but I want them to understand that I will always promote the Car Guy Coffee podcast. I will always support Lou and Fred and everything that they do because they're great friends and they support Absolutely. the Automotive Architect Sales podcast also. Said you're going to be in uh, Digital Dealer, my friend, up uh, in Vegas? Most likely. I'm supposed to be doing a booth right now. That's a whole discussion. I uh, I had other plans, so I'm, I'm supposed to be doing a booth right now. I'm on the fence right now. With, with how we come to an arrangement with certain things. But most likely, even if I don't do my booth, I'll probably be walking around. It's about an 80% chance I'm going to be there. Excellent. I will be there my myself, and uh, I look forward to actually shaking your hand and, and having a conversation with you and uh, picking your brain as well as you could be picking mine. I don't know Definitely. what you'll get out of it, but we well, can keep sorry. growing together, man. We can I keep agree. growing keep together. Growing. Yes, sir. And that's the message that our, our good friends always, always uh, in, in beds in our head that you can always keep yes. growing and connecting and uh, taking care of one another. So any, any last final words on, on the audience, how they can reach you, how they can sure. Uh, talk sure. to you? So, uh, so, so the, my website is dealeretraining.com. That's the word dealer, the letter E and the word training.com. Uh, you can find me on Instagram, Stan Share, just, just the way you see my name, you know, at Stan Share. You can find me on Facebook. Uh, you can find me on LinkedIn. I'm everywhere. Um, if you need to call me, or I would say text me or call me. My number is 732-925-8362. Um, email me, Stan at DealerTraining.com. Uh, I welcome the opportunity to do a strategy session with you. Um, it's not about selling you. It's more about finding out what need you have. And I'll give you an example. I want to help everybody. There is a young lady this morning on Facebook. She put up uh, in one of the groups, she's looking for an example of uh, a training manual or an employee manual for an independent store. So, you know, I messaged her and she actually messaged me back while we're doing this podcast. And I said, Hey, listen, if you, uh, how about this? I'll gladly share some of my manuals with you, you know, because listen, I could go around and say, Hey, give me $99 for my manual. Or I could say here, I'll share it with you. Chances are, you know, maybe she'll implement some of the stuff. Maybe she won't. Maybe she'll create her own. Maybe she'll copy it. I'm not worried about the copywriting. What's important to me is that this young lady is going to have something that has my logo on it, some of my content on it, that maybe one day she'll remember that, hey, Stan came to help her and maybe she'll, she'll want to do business with me. And even if she doesn't, at least it's a good testimonial. Um, that's what I'm all about. I'm all about helping our community. You know, the money and everything that comes, you know, you just have to build the audience and you have to build your reputation. And uh, the reputation I want is I want people to know that I'm there to help people from the heart. I always talk about this. Everything that I do, my training, my consulting is from the heart. And there's no BS with me. I don't sugarcoat. I tell it like it is. And um, so hopefully she appreciates that. And, you know, when we're done with this podcast, I'm going to send her a couple of manuals that I've created over the years. Awesome. 
Awesome, awesome. Well, this episode is brought to you by Dealer Elite, the most recognized automotive social network in the world. Sign up now and engage with the best and brightest in the industry. Also, Street Volkswagen of Amarillo. They're trying to, or they are electrifying Amarillo and Volkswagen's electrifying the world right now with their new Volkswagen ID4. Don't forget to check out the new Volkswagen Taos, also the new and improved newest member of the SUV family. Go to www.streetvw.com and Garve Automotive. Garve Automotive Training, BDC, Finance, Sales and Management Training. Go to Garve, G A R V as in Victor, automotive.com and check out all the training that you can and also go and and log on to Stan's training also. He may have some stuff that I don't have. But also, don't forget, this podcast is on every platform out there. So you can go to iHeartRadio, Spotify, um, Audible, Amazon. You, you type it in. Go to Google. Go to your Google machine. Type in Automotive Architect Sales Podcast. You'll find one of the platforms on there. Click on it. Also, don't forget the Manager TO podcast is also on every platform that you have to um, look up if you ever want some great content. And Sam, thank you for being on, my friend. It was a utmost pleasure. We need to do this again. We got you for a minute on an hour and 38 minutes. It's been Love great. It. And I look forward to meeting you and running into you, having dinner or whatnot at <laughs> Digital Dealer. And uh, any last words, any yeah. words of wisdom? I, you know what, just, you know, if anything, you know, check out my book once it's out, I'll be promoting it. Hopefully you're promoting it as well. But really, you know, my, my words of wisdom is just don't give up. You know, um, we fail every day at something, you know, we also win every day at something. So whatever happens, um, you know, whether you go broke, whether your business fails, don't be afraid to go back and go back to basics. I literally went back to basics. I took a job that was below my skill set uh, where I, you know, I was going head to head with the marketing director and she tried to be my boss and we worked for a year and I put up with it, but I had to humble myself to learn from my mistakes. And, and my recommendation to people is just don't be afraid to go back to basics for a year. But in that one year, not only should you gain lessons, but you should literally use every skill that you have so that you can either get the job done, but also have your, uh, your side hustle to build yourself back up. That's the only way you're going to get back on top. Remember, I paid off 30 grand in debt and saved myself from losing my home in eight months. Not a lot of people can do that. And I only did it because of, you know, opportunities, learning from podcasts like this, from, from just waking up in the morning, spending 15 minutes of my day, you know, watching a podcast, reading a book, um, you know, there's a lot of good things out there. Glenn Lundy's got the rise and grind, which sadly I can't wake myself up early enough to, to, to be on exactly. it. But, you know, you got the breakfast of champions. You got modern day car sales. There's so much opportunity out there. There is no reason at all for anybody to, to just give up and, and just die. Cause you know, I don't even want to retire. You know, they say, you know, retirement's what 67. I'm going to retire when I die. I'm going to keep working because at the end of the day, what else do we have in this life? You know, you have to keep, you know, keep yourself refreshed. So don't give up. If, you, if something happens, go back to basics. It's a year of your life. Time does fly by fast. It feels like it's a long, exhausting process, which it is, but it does go by fast when you're really busy. You know, forget about all the nonsense, put your blinders on and just focus on success and you will get there. And no matter what industry, no matter what you do in life. Absolutely. I appreciate you being on my friend. Thank Tune you. in next week to the automotive architect sales podcast. Got another special guest and don't forget people. You got to love one another. You got to take care of one another. The world is big enough for everyone.